we're continuing on from Galatians, and, and this morning I want to outline where I hope to go in the next 20 minutes. Uh, four words. That's it. Four words. Information, realization, formation, and transformation. Four words, four parts of a little message, but they're not even parts. Some of them will be longer than others. So we're going to start with information. And if you have a Bible, or if it's on your phone and you want to turn to it, or if you just want to read along with me up on there, but it's quite a lot and it's not that large, we are reading from chapter 4, starting at verse 8. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I am telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right, but let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. I said as I started to hold on to that idea of challenging or agreeing or disagreeing with people at home. You know, being part of this community... I hope you know that each and every one of you are valued and your opinion is appreciated, even if it is different from everybody else. Paul cared greatly for the Galatian church and therefore out of his love for them, a desire for them to become more Christ-like, he challenged them. My prayer is that if that is what God wants, that will be the same this morning. You see, initially, I had thought this message would simply be called selective memory. You know, selective memory? I'm sure we all have selective memory. Selective memory of things, you know, oh, back in my day, this happened. And it was so good. But we don't remember all the rubbish stuff as well. We sort of forget about that. We just pick the nice things. You know? Oh, school was so easy when we were there. Well, so much harder, sorry. It was so much harder when we were, when we were younger. You guys that are finishing school now, oh, bad luck, you know. We, we had to work right up until we had exams, and we had multiple exams. Uh, that, well, that's what we remember. Sometimes our memory is not quite great. It's a little bit selective. We pick what we want to. And so that's what I thought that this was about. In a way, I was looking at it going, oh, the Gentiles that Paul is speaking to, some of them have a selective memory about what it was like when they were 
well, when they were pagans, you know, people who wanted to worship these other things, they thought, oh, life was good back then. They had a selective memory. Selective memory to me is often in Scripture. The Israelites were prime examples of it. You know, oh, when we were back in Egypt, you know, it was, it was so much better back in Egypt. You're right, you were slaves. You know, yeah, but we had food. <laughs> mm, they had a selective memory. But as I went through, and as we're going to see in a few moments, as I went through it, I realized that selective memory is a stupid title. Because actually, in a way, it's the complete opposite. It's an all-embracing transformation. So selective, just part of it. This is, no, it's all-embracing. And it's not just a memory of something that has happened. It's a transformation. That is what Paul is trying to teach us. Well, God is teaching us through Paul's words that it's an all-embracing transformation. So those four words I said, information is the first one. Let's look at that. Well, that's the all-embracing transformation. But go back to information. Information. What do we actually learn? Now, I don't want to be doing a, a lecture, particularly I'm thinking of I'm spotting at the moment three young ladies who are, oh, and a, and a young gentleman, who are finishing school. Okay, so for, for some of them, they have got a lot of information that they need to remember and then share in the next few weeks as they sit their exams. A lot of information. But information, what do we learn from the Bible, from this passage? What is it telling us? What is the history or events surrounding this letter? Well, we've been talking a lot about Galatians over the last few weeks, so I don't need to go into too much information. I hope you can remember a couple of things. I hope you can remember that the Galatian church was Jewish and Gentile believers coming together. It, it had been these Gentile believers, who these Gentiles who had heard the good news and believed, and yet now there were people who were coming into this church trying to twist things a bit and say they had to follow these laws, these rules, these times. That was what you needed to be to be fully saved. You know, they, they were trying to change things. And some of the Jewish believers went that way. Some of the Gentiles were now trying to follow that as well. See, the Gentiles had previously followed what Paul calls these so-called gods. Hence, they came from this background where they worshipped created things. There were many gods, and they saw the worship of these created things as a way to succeed in life. You know, they wanted success, financial success. They wanted relationship success. They wanted their land and crops to grow. And they would worship and off do offerings to these gods so that things would be fine for them, that their life would be successful. Paul cares greatly for the people. And he tells them that he has become like them because... He is free in Christ, like they can be free in Christ, because God, Jesus himself, came for them. And Paul reinforces this idea in his first letter to the Corinthians. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. 
I obey the law of Christ. So he's saying, he's not saying he still does the law. He's saying he's free in Christ, but there are things that he will do and not do, but he will be what he is so that he can share and be with other people. In Galatians, Paul goes further by flipping things upside down. He uses an analogy of children and labor pains to demonstrate how much he cared for the Galatians. Now, children were not held in high regard. So that's a bit interesting. But he's showing that God loves, cares for children as much as he cares for everybody else. And then he goes into the metaphor of pain in childbirth. And that's something that some people would here might be able to know more than others. But I think we all grasp how intense it would be. There is so much information in those verses, in that passage, that I'd encourage you to study it. But I want to go on to our second word, which is realization. Realization, this is simply the moment or period when the information that you have received makes sense. You understand the truth. It is the moment when you respond. The Galatians had realized that Jesus was the Christ and many of the Gentile believers had realized and they had been living in freedom with Christ. They had this realization. Unfortunately, now some of them were going back. Paul tries to remind them of a time they realized the truth. He tells them, you didn't get it. Then with Christ, you did, and you were free in Christ. I have become free in Christ. You can be free in Christ. Don't go back. He tells them it's not just an intellectual decision. He challenged their selective memory. He compliments them on the fact that they had listened even when he was not well. Whatever that sickness was, I don't know. I'm not sure. But Paul realized that when they encountered Christ, they grasped the truth. They responded not to Paul, but to Jesus himself. Now, it's interesting because... What Paul says when he emphasizes that comment about being sick and unwell is that in many cases at that time, and even today in some ways, people would have seen an illness or a weakness as a reason not to listen to someone. In a pagan society that they had grown up in, particularly the Gentiles we're talking about, they had seen things in terms of winning favor with the gods. And if you were fit and healthy and successful, you had won favor with the gods. And if you weren't, the opposite was true. Sadly, although slightly different, I think occasionally we do the same. We look at life and go, life is difficult. We're sick. There is, you know, for some reason, maybe there's, some healing we've been praying for and it, and it hasn't happened. And our response can occasionally be, oh, perhaps we haven't won favor with God or we haven't done something for God, like we haven't prayed hard enough. Jesus, Jesus, God in the flesh, in terms of the world, you could argue didn't have a successful life. He was beaten, he was crucified and killed And yet, was he not loved by the Father? See, many, many times, God has chosen to speak through the unexpected. Unlikely people. Paul was one of those people at that stage. And Paul was aware throughout his ministry of the need for people to encounter not just an articulate, persuasive speaker, but a very powerful God. So, I'm going to read a story. And I sometimes have illustrations, and you think of, oh, I'm trying to think of a personal illustration. I'm just going to read a story 
Um, I got it in off, off the computer off, uh, online. Um, I've read about this person. I've read various things. I tried to find it in various books, but I just found it online. So I'm just going to read it. So please excuse me as I just read. Hopefully, you will be, um, you'll get the point of it. Henry Nguyen was a priest and a brilliant... I have a picture of him. There he is. It's, um, which way do we put it? He's the older gentleman, is Henry Nguyen. Henry Nguyen was a priest and a brilliant teacher at places like Harvard and Yale. Feeling led by God, he spent the last decade of his life living in a community of people with severe emotional, mental, and physical challenges. It was an enormously healing time for him. In one of his many books, Henry tells a story about Trevor. That's Trevor sitting beside him. Trevor was a man with severe mental and emotional challenges who was sent by Henry's um, community to a psychiatric facility for evaluation. Henry wanted to see him. So he, he called the hospital to arrange a visit. When those in authority found out that Henry Noon was coming, they asked if they could have lunch with him in the Golden Room, a special meeting room at the facility. They would also invite doctors and clergy people to the special luncheon, and Henry agreed. When Henry arrived, they took him to the Golden Room, but Trevor was nowhere to be seen. Troubled, Henry asked about Trevor's whereabouts. Uh, Trevor cannot come to lunch, he was told. Patients and staff are not allowed to have lunch together. Plus, no patient has ever had lunch in the Golden Room. By nature, Henry was not, confrontational, was not a confrontational person. He was a meek man. But being guided by the Spirit, here is the thought that came to Henry's mind. Include Trevor. Knowing that community is about inclusion, Henry thought, Trevor ought to be here. So Henry turned to the person in authority and said, but the whole purpose of my coming was to have lunch with Trevor. If Trevor is not allowed to attend the lunch, I will not attend either. The thought of missing an opportunity for lunch with Henry Nguyen was too much. They soon found a way for Trevor to attend. When they all gathered together, something interesting happened. At one point during the lunch, Henry was talking to the person on his right and didn't notice that Trevor had stood up, lifted his glass of Coca-Cola. A toast! I will now offer a toast, Trevor said to the group. Everybody in the room got nervous. What was he going to do? Then Trevor, this deeply challenged man in a room full of PhDs, started to sing. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. Nobody was sure what to do. It was awkward. Here was this man with a level of challenge and brokenness they couldn't understand. Yet he was beaming. He was thrilled to be there. So they started to sing softly at first, and then louder and louder, until doctors and clergymen and Henry Nguyen were all practically shouting, if you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. Henry went on to give a talk at the luncheon, but the moment everybody remembered, the moment God spoke most clearly was through the person they all would have said was the least likely person to speak for God. That is not just a great story, but an excellent segue into our third word, formation. Paul wanted to help the Gentiles become, develop, seek direction in their relationship with Jesus. He chose to become like the Gentiles, to live with them, to love, serve, teach them. He avoided doing things that went against God, but saw God working in unexpected people in unexpected ways. And he knew God was welcoming all people. 
Paul wanted the Galatians to discover how to be spirit-led Christ followers as Gentile Christians, rather than seeking them, seeking to make them Jewish Christians. And I believe Paul would say to us, he would want us to discover how to be spirit-led Christ followers as, as Kiwi Christians. Our final word is transformation. As we are formed, it is through the Holy Spirit, the Galatians, we, all followers of Christ, can see a radical change. A conversion into another form. A transformation. Paul had undergone a transformation when he first encountered Christ, but it's not a one-off thing. It was a continuing. He was continually being transformed by the power of the Spirit alive in him. He shares with the Galatians words that describe part of this transformation. Words I've mentioned before that scare the living daylights out of me. I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you, Gentiles, free from those laws. However, perhaps the words that scare me the most is what he wrote in Corinthians and expresses more clearly an understanding of this transformation and what it will look like when Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's not putting himself up on a pedestal to say, look at me. He's saying, the closer I get to Christ, and the more that you see that in me, the transformation that's incurring in my life, try to imitate that because that is Christ transforming me. The more Christ-like we become, the fuller that transformation is. That can only occur through the power of the Holy Spirit. Information, realization, formation, transformation. Where are we? It's not like a, a line. Like we've said, you know, there's moving, transformation's continuing. Are you like the Galatian Gentiles who struggled with being free, the freedom one can have in Christ? Perhaps you might be putting too much emphasis on things other than Christ. Even to the point of being, like many of them were, enslaved to them. Some things we can become enslaved to are not in themselves evil. They may be good things or just reality of living how we live today. But is it the creation or the creator we are worshipping? Right? Things that dominate our lives, jobs. Mortgages, expectations, families. What about fear of failure? What if money wasn't an issue? What if you didn't care about people's expectations? What would be your desire? What would be on your bucket list? You know, contrast those things to these questions, what is God saying to you, to us? What would you, us, look like if we were really transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit? I want to confess and perhaps challenge us with something I have been stewing over for a while now. Are we turning to God or someone or something else? Or what I can see in my own life sometimes that I'm ashamed to admit is sometimes trying to do the work of God apart from the presence of God. 
Are we really, I'm talking to myself here, you can include yourself here if you think this includes you, are we really seeking God's all-embracing transformation? One way we can help each other's formation, transformation, is through relationships. Paul cared for those he sent that letter to. He showed how much he cared for the community by committing to be part of it. We can do the same. Discerning together what God is saying, using our gifts and talents to support and encourage others. And in this church, like in a lot of Baptist churches and in other churches, one of the ways we do that is um, by membership. Membership. 